Hi, I'm Andrew Ward, pastor at Community Baptist Church, and we're excited to have you join us for this service. Hey, if you're in the Flagler County area and you don't have a church home, we want to invite you to come join us. On Sunday mornings, we meet at 1030 for our worship service, and then we have a midweek fill-up service on Wednesdays at 645. I pray that today's message is a blessing. God bless. I'd like to ask you, if you would, to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5 will continue on with our study through the book of Romans. As you're doing that, I want to ask you to consider this question. How would you respond if someone asked you, why do you need a Savior? Why is it that you need a Savior? Uh, this question is foundational to all that the, the Bible teaches. Now, the Bible answers that question in the passage that we're studying today. And I'd like to begin, uh, before we dig into the passage we're studying, just resetting the context, remind you of where we've been and what's the context into which uh, this passage comes. Of course, we uh, know that the theme of the book of Romans, uh, found in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, we uh, saw this uh, a few months ago as we began our study in the book of Romans. Paul says here, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God, for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. You remember as, as we looked at that passage of Scripture, uh, central to everything that Paul is teaching in the book of Romans is this idea, uh, the significance of the gospel. Uh, more specifically, you see there, he, he says that it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And of course, we talked about the fact that everything else in the book of Romans really flows out of those, uh, those two verses. Continuing on, uh, in our study, we also learned in chapter 1, verse 18, all the way down to chapter 3, verse 20, that we need the gospel. How come? Well, we need the gospel because of our sin against God. And the reality is that, that we are powerless to do anything to deliver ourselves from that sin. And that's the reason that God Himself sent His Son, Jesus, to pay the penalty for sin. This is a very important point, because the only way that we're forgiven by God, or we might also say justified by God, the only way that this takes place is by faith in Jesus Christ. And we saw as we looked at Romans 3, 21 to 31, uh, Paul talking about this, this idea uh, the requirement that God gives to us is that we would repent of our sin uh, and put our faith in Jesus Christ. Continuing on in our study, when we came to chapter 4, uh, we saw that Paul points to Abraham and, and David, uh, two prominent figures in the Old Testament. He points to them as illustrations of justification by faith. And he's teaching us that this has, in fact, always been God's requirement for salvation. Now, that's an important point, that we recognize that there is no way that people are saved in the Old Testament, and then a different way that they're saved in the New Testament. But Paul is, is very clearly demonstrating for us that salvation has always been by faith. And so he points to these two very prominent figures in the Old Testament, Abraham and, and, and David, to demonstrate that fact. And then in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, uh, we learned about the results of justification by faith. There in the first five verses of, of chapter 5, uh, the Bible gives us three reasons that Christians should and can celebrate because they've been justified by faith. You'll remember that I shared with you that God tells us that we have peace with Him. Certainly, if there was a reason to celebrate, recognizing that before we came to faith in Jesus Christ, that we were enemies of God. And, and so Paul tells us that we now have peace with Him. Certainly a reason for us to, 
to, to celebrate. Another reason to celebrate, uh, Paul shared with us, was the expectation of the glory of God. And then finally, we talked about the fact that we can and should celebrate uh, because of the hope that we have even in the midst of tribulations, even in problems and trials and the struggles of life in Christ, we still have hope. And so we can celebrate in that. Continuing on in verses uh, 6 through 11, we learn that salvation is certain and it is motivated by God's love. This is the reason. That's a very important point for us to understand as we're, we're, we're getting a biblical understanding of what God says about us and, and our need for salvation. To recognize that we are not saved because of anything that we did, and God did not send His Son as a sacrifice because we merited it, because of anything that we did to earn salvation or to earn Christ being willing to sacrifice His life. Paul tells us that the reason for Jesus coming is love. It's God's love for us. Now, that's a, a glorious truth right there in and of itself. I didn't earn my salvation. I didn't do something to, to make Jesus come. It was a gift of God uh, motivated by His love. And, and the same holds true not only for coming to faith in Jesus Christ, but, but also for continuing on in the faith. And then ultimately, as we look to glory and the promise uh, that God has given to us in Christ, a place in heaven, all of this is a work of God. That's what Paul is demonstrating here throughout Romans, but we see that throughout uh, the New Testament. This idea that, that, that God has, has done this work Himself. And because of that, we can certainly rest. We can have confidence. We can have assurance. That's what, what in part, Paul is doing here in, in teaching us this, is that we might experience the, the blessings and the joy of our salvation, knowing that it is brought about uh, by God. <clears throat> then in the, the rest of, of chapter 5, verses uh, 12 through 21, which we begin studying today, uh, the Bible addresses an important question. I think a very important question, in fact, uh, at the heart of, of this teaching in Romans 5, 12 to 21, is, is a question that Paul is answering. And that question is, how can just one sacrifice pay for so much sin? We think about what Paul said in, in Romans 1, 18 to 3, 20. We recognize all of us are sinners separated from God. And, and so I think naturally and even reasonably, the question that comes to mind, how can just one sacrifice pay for so much sin? I mean, we're talking about the sins of, of, of people uh, from Adam forward. How is that possible? And Paul is, is dealing with that very issue. We'll pick up that study here this morning. We're looking at Romans chapter 5, uh, verses 12 to 14. We're going to see that, uh, that they teach us uh, that for good or bad, our actions have consequences and our choices are the reason that we need a Savior. Now, we're only going to, to look at, at, at verses 12 to 14, but... To set the context, I'd like to read uh, the remainder of chapter 5 to you, uh, just to, to give you that, that frame of reference. So, beginning with verse 12, God's inspired, inerrant, and infallible word says this, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin... And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. 
The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you and thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that is so clearly demonstrated and ministered to us through Christ Jesus, our Lord. We thank you for the hope that we have in the gospel of Christ and putting our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, secures our salvation eternally. Father, I lift up to you every person that's listening to this message today. God, that you would prepare their hearts for the teaching of your word. Help us to understand more clearly who you are and what you have to say and how your word applies to our life. And God, may we, as a celebration and an offering of praise to you, live in humble obedience to what you teach us. You are great and you are glorious and you are worthy of our praise. And we commit this time of teaching to you. We pray that you be honored in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, from the reading, uh, you notice that this uh, text makes a a sort of complex argument. Uh, In in chapter 5, verses 12 to 21, it focuses on answering this question, how could just one sacrifice pay for so much sin? Uh, The focus of the passage that we're looking at uh, this morning is is taking a piece of Paul's answer to that uh, that implied question or that assumed question. Uh, We're going to take a piece of that, deal with it uh, this morning, uh, specifically focusing in on this question of why do we need a Savior in the first place? Uh, To answer that question, this passage deals with three other questions, and I'll frame my teaching around the answers to those questions. Those three questions are first, how did sin and death come into the world? That's an important question, logical question. Certainly, as someone's studying what God says about salvation, how is it, in fact, that sin and death came into the world in the first place? Why is this even a problem? Uh, The second question that I'll deal with, uh, how can people who never knew the law of God be held accountable for keeping the law? Paul's going to deal with that question as well. And finally, why is Adam connected with Jesus in this passage? What's going on there? So we'll deal with those three questions, uh, uh, framing the teaching around the answers to those three questions. So the first question comes out of verse 12. How did sin and death come into uh, the world? Uh, Look with me there. Uh, Very first word in verse 12, therefore. This is indicating that that Paul will now deal with a question that naturally comes from the the teaching that people are justified by faith. Uh, That is, how is it possible, given the sinfulness of, 
of people, coupled with, look, just the sheer number of sins that people have committed. How is it possible that just one sacrifice truly pays for all that. Uh, We might ask Paul, how is it possible? How do I know that I won't get to heaven and God's going to to, to give me a a balance due? Notice, how is that possible? Look, we we studied for uh, several weeks those 63 verses from Romans chapter 1 verse 18 to chapter 3 verse 20 uh, where where Paul is is explaining the the depths of the sin of humanity both individually as well as collectively we're all in the same boat all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God how could Jesus's sacrifice pay for all that how's that even possible well, in answering that question, I think it will would be helpful uh, to take a step back uh, and, and to deal with this question, how did sin come into the world in the first place? And, and Paul addresses that very issue. Uh, again, look there at the beginning of verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world... And what we see here, uh, Paul is directing our attention back to the creation narrative. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and and, and 17. Uh, Moses records there, The Lord God commanded man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. Now stop right there. This is God speaking to Adam. And he has created uh, everything. Uh, he says in, in Genesis 1.31 that his creation is very good. Adam lived in a world that didn't know any death or disease or, or violence. Uh, didn't know the things that are so common and prevalent in this world today. He didn't know any of those things. And yet God is giving Adam uh, the opportunity to live in this world. And he gives him just one command. And you see that he says here, uh, from any tree of the garden you may freely eat. Verse 17, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat from it, you will surely die. Now, what's going on here? God is giving Adam in this command the opportunity to love God, to demonstrate His love for God by simple, humble obedience. Now, don't get hung up on the tree. Uh, There's nothing magical about this tree. God could have just as easily said, Adam, don't go sit on that log. You can do anything you want, but don't sit on that log. This was an opportunity for Adam to trust God, to obey God, to believe God. Just this one command. Other than that, there were no other commands. Adam was was free to enjoy uh, God's creation. And yet we see that there was a a terrible consequence that would come if, if God was not enough for Adam. If Adam insisted on more than what God had given to him, God said, it will cost you your life. Very stiff penalty that we, that we see here. And, and of course, we know as we continue on in Genesis chapter 3, if you're familiar with that passage of Scripture, you know that, that Adam was, was tempted, uh, tempted to disobey God, uh, Satan tempting him. And we come down to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. It says, when the woman, that is his wife Eve, when the woman saw that the tree, that is the tree that God commanded that Adam not eat from, uh, that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. This, the Bible tells us, is the place, the reason why sin came into the world. We might summarize it and say it very simply. Adam rebelled against God. Our first father rebelled against God. And that rebellion carried with it terrible consequences. 
We're going to talk more about that as we continue on, but the point I want you to, to take from what we've just talked about is this, that all sin began with this one rebellion. That's what the Bible teaches us very clearly. Now, the Bible also tells us that there is a penalty for sin. God mentioned it back there in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Um, but Paul also mentions it. Look there towards the middle of verse 12. He says there, and death through sin. Back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, God speaks about this. He says, by the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground. That is, Adam, you will die because from it you were taken. That is, from the ground. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, it's very important as we're thinking about this idea of death. What the Bible teaches about it, because there are some unfamiliar with, uh, with Scripture, come to this, uh, this passage in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, and, and they say, well, God said Adam would die, and he disobeyed, and yet he didn't die. Well, it's important, again, that we understand the, uh, the teaching in Scripture as it relates to death. There are at least three aspects that we can find in, in Scripture related to death. Uh, one of those would be the spiritual aspect. The spiritual aspect. Now, the moment that Adam rebelled against God, he spiritually died. What does that mean? But that he was separated from God spiritually. Prior to that, Adam enjoyed intimate, personal fellowship with God. And immediately that was broken when he disobeyed and rebelled against God. So spiritual death is one aspect of death. Here's another. Uh, we will all eventually face physical death. The Bible says that it's appointed once for a man to die. The physical death. Now, it's also important to recognize this isn't what God intended. That this did not have to happen. But Adam's rebellion brought that physical death not only upon himself, but upon all of his children, of whom every human being is a member of that family. So physical death is the second type of death that's spoken of in Scripture. Here's the third. Um, for the person who dies in their sin. This is the person that refuses to repent and put their faith in Jesus Christ. There is a third type of death, and that is an eternal death. Uh, this is to say when, when the person who is not a Christian, who has not repented and put their faith in Jesus Christ, dies physically, their soul leaves their body and is immediately ushered into a place called hell. And they will remain there, the Bible says eventually, uh, their destination will be the lake of fire. So three different types of death that are spoken of in the Bible. And so God says that Adam would die immediately. He spiritually did that very thing. Uh, ultimately, he physically died. Now, the condition of his soul, we don't know, uh, but we know that the Bible speaks of these three different types of death. Now, listen. There's a, an important point of application here I don't want you to miss. Uh, if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are unsure about that. It's important that you recognize and understand that you don't need to do anything whatsoever to receive eternal death. You simply do nothing. Go along and live your life as you have been living it, and the result will be eternal death, separated from God. All people are born into this world separated from God because of their sin. All you need to do to go to hell is just keep going the way that you've been going. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. That's a fact. Whether we believe it or not is not relevant with the exception of 
our own eternal destiny. God tells us that the wages, the penalty for sin is death. Now, you may hear that and think, that is a very stiff penalty. Why is, is, it, is it such a, a terrible punishment for sin? Maybe you think to yourself, look, I'm not that bad of a person. I, I try to do what I can to be a good person. I try to help people out. I'm a good neighbor. I come to church from time to time. I've, I've even given money. How, why is it that, that the penalty for sin would be death? Well, I think in explaining that, we, we recognize that we are familiar in our own justice system with the idea that the punishment should fit the crime. Uh, we're protected in our Constitution against cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, this means, for example, that a person doesn't need to be worried about getting sentenced to prison for going five miles over the speed limit. Uh, on the other side of the equation, we're thinking about this idea of the punishment fitting the crime. Uh, we also recognize that, that people who commit the most heinous crimes should be severely punished, even to the point of, of death. And so that brings the question, why is it that God would send good people to hell? I recognize that there's different punishments, but again, I'm just not that bad of a person. Why would God send people to hell uh, just because they've made some mistakes? Well, I think the, the, the first uh, step we need to take in answering that question, why, that supposed question, of why would good people be sent to hell, uh, I think that we first need to define uh, what is a, a good person. And are we, in fact, good people? I recognize that although all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, uh, we are, for the most part, by God's grace, we are not as bad as we could be. But by God's grace... Um, we live in a society where, by and large, people are, 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 are good to one another, uh, that we can live with one another, live around one another. But, but the standard that God is measuring by is not the standard of the world to see whether I'm good or not. It's the standard of perfect holiness. This is what God requires. You want an illustration of that? I don't think that there's a clearer illustration uh, that we could uh, see in Scripture of this cause and effect relationship between someone committing a sin and God's response to it, I don't think there's a clearer example than what we've just talked about in Genesis chapter 3. I mean, if you sit down and think about this for a few minutes, what is being said in the text there in Genesis chapter 3 is that God has given a command to the first man uh, to not eat from a tree. And Adam disobeys and takes a bite from the tree. And, and because of that, sin comes into the world. Now again, I, I think that any reasonable person needs to, to wrestle with this issue. Are you telling me that every disease and every death and every war and every hurt that's ever come into the world flows out of one man taking a bite of a piece of fruit? That's hard for us to come to terms with, isn't it? I mean, if we're honest, that, that is a very, very challenging thing to wrestle with. And yet this demonstrates the great divide between the holiness of God and, and the, the, the best that man can do. Uh, there is no comparison there. God is perfect and holy and Adam rebelled against a perfect and holy God. And although in our minds we would minimize that rebellion as being insignificant in the grand scheme of things, it just demonstrates our lack of understanding of the perfection and the holiness of God. God is perfect and He is holy. And if we imagine that we're going to uh, face him on judgment day, and we are, are going to uh, somehow negotiate with him, pointing out all of the good things that we've done, all of the reasons that he should allow us into heaven, we have completely missed the mark uh, 
in understanding the holiness of God. God is perfect. And the wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible teaches us. And yet the free gift of God, as Paul continues on in that verse, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That God has made this way. That's the glorious truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we have rebelled against God and God has sacrificed His own Son to make payment available. But it is absolutely essential that we come to terms with what the Bible says about our sinful condition. The fact is that there are no good people. And every one of us is deserving of hell because of our rebellion against God. It is first and foremost against God. Our rebellion, our sin, even when we sin against someone else, it's against God. We also need to remember that sin has consequences. We see here in this passage of Scripture, Adam's sin, as we've already talked about, afflicted all people. Look with me towards the end of verse 12. And so death spread to all men. The result of Adam's rebellion is that death spread to all men. God told Adam that if he disobeyed, he would bring death into the world. And the consequence of Adam's sin is that he brought a curse on all of his children. I think there's an important lesson we need to take away from this. It's one that undoubtedly we are all familiar with. Some of us suffering painful consequences of sin. We recognize that choices have consequences, don't we? For good or bad, choices have consequences. And the Bible teaches that that people are made in the image of God. And one of the ways that we reflect God's image is our ability to make meaningful choices. God calls on us to make choices for His glory, to live our lives for His glory, rather than living for ourselves. It's so vitally important that we recognize that choices have consequences. The choice to rebel against God has consequences. But God calls on us to, to, choose, uh, to, to live our lives for the glory of God, uh, to make that, that choice. Everything that we do, in fact, the Bible tells us that, that we're to do for the glory of God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. This is everything. It's everything. This means uh, uh, every conversation to the glory of God. Uh, how you uh, spend your money to the glory of God. Uh, your, your work on your job or, or at home, wherever it is, to the glory of God. Uh, how you take care of your health, to the glory of God. All things to the glory of God. The, these are, are the choices that we are to make as we're living our lives for the glory of God. Because look, if you're not doing something for the glory of God, what are you doing it for? What's the reason? Are you living your life to satisfy uh, your own lusts, the lust of your, of your own body? Are you living for yourself? John tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15-17, to 17, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of the Father lives forever. Exhorting us to live for God. To live for the glory of God. Let me ask you a question. Are the choices that you made last week glorifying to God? In and of yourself, it's important to know that you cannot make choices for the glory of God. Apart from Christ, you can't do anything for the glory of God. However, Christian, walking by the Spirit ensures that you are making choices for the glory of God. It's the reason Paul says in Galatians 5.16, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. 
So let me reset the, the table here. Uh, we've covered a considerable amount of, of ground. We've, we've seen how sin came into the world and that the penalty for sin is, is death. We've also seen that Adam's sin afflicted all people. But the reality is, this is not some uh, abstract concept or, or some idea that is divorced from us and our own choices. We are also guilty of sin. Sin is practiced by all people. Look with me at the last phrase there in verse 12. Because all sinned. Now, there are two different aspects in which the Bible teaches that all sinned. First, by imputation. Imputation is the idea of crediting something to someone else. Putting something in someone's account, you might say. There are three ways in Scripture that the word imputa- or that imputation is, is taught. Uh, first off, we see that Adam's sin was imputed to all people. That's one way. Adam rebelled and his sin was reputed, uh, I'm sorry, imputed to all people. Another way, we see that the sins of all people who would believe in Jesus were imputed to Jesus while he was on the cross. Another way, the wrath of God fell upon Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Father imputed sin to the perfect, sinless Son, Jesus Christ. He hadn't done the sin, but the Father imputed the sin to him. And he took the wrath of God to pay that penalty for sin. Uh, Third way, the righteousness of Jesus is imputed to those who have been born again. Now this is a wonderful, glorious truth. Reality that for the Christian, that the righteousness of Christ has been imputed or put into your account. It's the reason Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's That's a wonderful truth. The fact that God sees the Christian through the righteousness of Christ. What a glorious truth. So, we sin through imputation. We also choose to sin. The second way. Again, Paul says there at the end of verse 12, because all sin, not only is sin imputed, but we also choose to sin. The the statement all sin indicates not only the imputation, but, but our choice to rebel against God. The reality is that apart from God, we will always choose sin. That's another consequence, by the way, of our first father Adam's rebellion against God passed on to us. We will always choose sin. Now, before we close out this section, I just want to draw your attention very likely in your copy of of the Scriptures. Uh, There at the end of verse 12, you you probably notice a long dash after the word sin. You ever wonder what what that's all about? Well, Paul is drawing a comparison between uh, death in Adam and life in Christ. He's drawing that comparison throughout verses 12 through 21. Uh, And he's begun doing that. Um, He's going to now, however, deal with an important question. uh, And so the flow of thought is going to change. And that long hyphen is a signal that he's going to change that flow of thought. He'll come back and pick up this flow of thought, by the way, when we get to, to verse 18. But that's the reason for that long dash there in your Bible. Second question that we're going to to deal with in in this text. How can people who never knew the law of God be held accountable for keeping the law? So, so Paul recognizes um, himself a Jew, uh, himself having been trained as a teacher of the Jewish faith, that the people are very familiar with the law. 
In fact, the Jewish people are looking at the world through the prism of the law, we might say, and how do people relate to the law, and in, in, in what way uh, so much of their life was, was uh, consumed with, with the, the regulations, um, the law and the additional regulations that were added to it. And so certainly they, they've got to, to wonder, um, what about the law? I mean, how can people who never knew the law of God be held accountable for keeping the law? Because we've been talking about Adam, and that very likely brings up this question. And people must be wondering, well, wait a minute. Adam sinned, and sin came into the world, but the law wasn't given until Moses. What's going on during that time? He unpacks that for us here in verse 13, talking about the period between Adam's sin and the, the law. Look with me at verse 13. He starts off there, for until the law. He's talking about the, the time between Adam's sin and the giving of the law. Thinking about a timeline, we understand that creation uh, was about 4,000 B.C. How long after that Adam rebelled, we, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. However, uh, we do know that very likely uh, the giving of the law uh, was about 1491 B.C. Therefore, what you have is roughly a 2,500-year period of time in between there. And this is, this is what Paul's dealing with. What about that period of time uh, there? Now, before we move on and deal with that directly, I'd like to say something, a brief comment. Um, about Genesis 1 to 11. And, and what we've, we've just talked about here, because uh, you notice that, that I've given you a timeline that conflicts um, with, with much of the teaching in public school, and I'll use this term uh, rather loosely, uh, science classes, teaching that the wor world is uh, billions of, of years old. I, I do not believe that. I, I disagree. It's untrue. I believe what the Bible says, and, and there is no way that you can read Genesis 1 to 11 uh, and just take it for what it says and not come to the conclusion that the writer, Moses, uh, that he was intending to give Genesis 1 to 11, uh, as he did with the rest of Genesis, um, as, a, as a historical narrative, uh, that is what he intended with that. And yet, uh, this idea conflicts with contemporary beliefs uh, that the earth is billions of years old. By the way, I would submit that those beliefs are not rooted in science so much as they are rooted in uh, the desire to come up with an explanation for the world and more specifically for people independent of God. People don't want to give an answer to God, certainly not the God of the Bible. And so because of that, I see that people are willing to believe anything as long as they don't have to believe the Bible. And so this is the reason for it. Uh, and, and yet, as we look at the text of Genesis 1 to 11, I believe that it is unreasonable to contend that it is anything other than a literal historical narrative. And if it's not, we have a much larger problem. You see, the Bible assumes that Genesis 1 to 11 is legitimate history. Because if, if, if Genesis 1 to 11 is not true history, then Adam never existed. And if Adam didn't exist then everything that Paul says in Romans 5, 12 to 21 is a lie. Here's the point. You can trust Genesis 1 to 11 along with the rest of Scripture. It is inspired by God. It is inerrant. It is infallible. You can trust God's Word. That's what happened, Genesis 1 to 11. You want to know what happened in the early years of creation? There it is, Genesis 1 to 11. 
So we're, we're dealing with this, this question, this period of time between Adam's sin and the law. So we've established that uh, uh, timeline there. Uh, and, and, and we see that all people since Adam have, have sinned. How do we know that? We'll look towards the middle of uh, verse 13. Sin was in the world. Paul acknowledged that sin is in the world during that 2,500 year period of time. Um, if you, 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 you're trying to understand, well, what was going on during that time because there wasn't uh, the command of Moses, how could people be held accountable for sin? Well, they're not held accountable for the command of Moses. Because if you don't have the law, you aren't judged by it. Look towards the middle of verse 13. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. That is to say that God doesn't charge people with particular incidents of breaking the law before people have the law. However, this doesn't mean that people are not guilty of sin. How do we know? Well, we know because death is the consequence of any sin. And we can look at that 2,500 year period of time between Adam and the giving of the law, and we see that they continued to die, giving evidence of sin. Look at verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense. Remember, death is a consequence of sin. The two go hand in hand. Granted, these people who don't have God's law, aren't sinning in the likeness of Adam, as Paul says there at the end of verse 14. Adam was given a command by God, and he rebelled against that command. Those who don't have those direct commands are not guilty of of breaking the direct command. However, we're still not off the hook. Why? Because God has given us a conscience, hasn't he? He's also uh, written a knowledge of himself on our heart. We can look at creation and see some general things uh, about God. We talked about that back in Romans 1, 18 to 20. God has written a knowledge of himself on our heart, so we are without excuse. We have a conscience. Those who die without the law are going to be held accountable uh, for violating their conscience. Therefore, we see that we are all guilty before God. This is the answer to the the question, how can people who have never had the law be accountable to the law? Final question I'd like to deal with here, uh, very end of verse 14. Again, I think another obvious question Paul is dealing with here, uh, why is Adam connected to Jesus in this passage of Scripture? Now, you see there, as you look towards the end of verse 14, he says, who is a type? Let me define that that word type for you. What are we talking about here? A type is something that prefigures something that is to come. It's It gives us a glimpse of something that is to come. Uh, Illustration here, uh, on Wednesdays, we're studying Exodus Uh, And in this, we see that Moses is a type of Jesus. How so? He has been sent as a deliverer of God's people. And in that way, he is foreshadowing or he is a type of the perfect fulfillment that would come in Christ Jesus. The New Testament, we see Jesus perfectly fulfilling that type or that shadow of deliverer. And that's what what Paul is making reference to here at the end of verse 14. More specifically, what, what I mean by that, Adam and Jesus both represent a group. That is how Adam is a type of the one who was uh, to come. Uh, you see that statement there at the end of verse 14. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 21-22, Paul says, For since by a man came death, that's Adam, and by a man also came the resurrection of the dead, that's Jesus. And verse 22, For as in Adam all die, so it, also in Christ all will be made alive. The Bible teaches that Adam is the representative of the group of people 
who rebel against God. Jesus is the representative of the people who have been redeemed by God through Jesus Christ when they put their faith in Him alone for salvation. And so in this way, Adam is a type or a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. He's he's prefiguring or pointing to the coming of Christ, the work of Christ, in that Adam represents a group of people and Jesus represents a group of people. That's the point that Paul is making there in that statement. Now, we've covered a lot of ground. Let me give you a summary here. In this section, in Romans 5, 12 to to, to 21, uh, Paul's explaining how Jesus' sacrifice is able to pay for so much sin. In the passage that we've looked at here today, uh, verses 12 to 14, Paul's reminding us of how we got into the problem of needing a Savior in the first place. Uh, He's also setting the stage to introduce Jesus and how His sacrifice is able to cover so much sin. Adam brought all this trouble into the world because of his selfish rebellion. Jesus brought life through His sacrificial obedience. Now, what do we do with this? Well, one of the significant points of application to be drawn from this passage is that choices have consequences. For good or bad, choices have consequences. Uh, Most often, uh, we won't have any real concept of how far-reaching the the nature uh, those consequences are. When we're doing something, how, how it's almost as if you've thrown a rock in the middle of the calm waters of a pond and you see these ripples travel on and, and on. Uh, that's an illustration of the, the consequences of our actions. Uh, the person who chooses to give up on their marriage, for example, may only be thinking about the relief uh, the separation is going to bring in that moment. That, that may be what they're focused on, is just dealing with a problem right there in that moment, not recognizing like you throw the rock into the pond. There are, are ripples that go on and, and, and on. Uh, that person is, is missing the long-term consequences uh, to ending their marriage, the consequences for their, their family, their church, uh, even their own heart. There are consequences. Choices have consequences. Here's another example. The person who chooses to waste resources that God has entrusted to them might only be seeking to live a life that, that satisfies their pleasure in, in the moment. However, that person not realizing or recognizing or acknowledging or living in light of the fact that those choices have consequences. They're missing out on participating in the eternal things of God, living their lives only for themselves to come to the end and see that they have wasted opportunity after opportunity that God has given to them to participate in the eternal things of God, even the things right here in this very church an example of choices having consequences. Here's one more. The young person who chooses to reject what God says about homosexuality and and gender, Uh, that that person may be most concerned with what other people think about them, with being accepted by, by a group. Tragically, young people are mutilating their bodies with hormone therapy and even surgery, seeking to find meaning and purpose, not recognizing that there are consequences. A few years down the road, however, you can be certain when they're broken and filled with sorrow over the foolish choices, over the ungodly decisions that they made. They didn't lead them to the the meaning and the purpose and the hope and the fulfillment that they had assumed that it would. Listen, because of the the brokenness from sin, we all feel a profound sense of, of loss. We recognize that something isn't right. We want things to be better. We oftentimes will choose our own way, come up with our own ideas about what that looks like and not realizing that the hope The thing that you're looking for, you'll find only in Jesus Christ. This passage is teaching us that what we seek, we will find only in Jesus. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 14 teach that for good or bad, 
actions have consequences and our choices are the reason that we need a Savior. For good or bad, your actions have consequences. So will you choose to glorify God in your decisions this week? I trust that the teaching of God's Word was a ministry to you today. Uh, Again, I want to invite you to come out to our services at 645 on Wednesday evenings and on Sunday morning for our worship at 1030. In addition to that, we have a variety of opportunities and activities throughout the week to minister to both children and adults. You can find out more information on our website. God bless. I hope you have a great day.